I understand what it's like to be that student alone. And I also understand what it's like to be a practitioner and show up for them. And so how can we use those two pieces to just continually be pressing practitioners forward to, to be in connection with that poor 18 year old kid who somebody should have said, I don't feel like it's going great for you. <laughs> well, I, I just think it's so helpful for, for our listeners to hear that piece of it because it is what really fuels all that you do, right? Uh, just thinking about, we have students who are on your campus and they feel very alone. What can you do to just say, I see you, right? Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This is season four, episode 17 of Cap and Gown. I'm excited today. I get to um, have a conversation with my co-host here. Rachel Phillips Buck. I'm Matt Boisvert. Rachel, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. I'm having a very hard time because Matt took my background away so that I wouldn't forget that I'm not in charge of the show today. <laughs> also, he's doing State of the Union and interviewing me. Yeah, so <sighs> this is my show today. And, <laughs> and you're my guest and it's going to be great. So um, Rachel, we have a lot to talk through. I'm excited to just talk through a lot of parts of who you are and your journey and into higher ed and, and all of that. But before we dive into that, um, this is a pretty exciting week of spring. There's a, it's a beautiful season here. Listen, people are, I have talked to so many clients this week and last, and they are just like, white knuckled holding onto the table like can we make it until may oh yeah so sure. it is just super busy everyone's involved in, in registration spring break didn't seem this time to have done anything to help students recover they've come back like more stressed out and more tired and so it's just it is a i think yeah. it's for sure a beautiful season we have a lot of schools that are still getting snow so spring yeah still like rolling in slowly, but also just super, super busy with good work. So. Yeah. Um, hey, so just as we get started, uh, one, one thing that that I normally do is introduce just a curious fact, as everyone should know, our theme for the year is curiosity. And so as we talk through, there's it's, uh, I don't know, kind of fun <laughs> to talk about interesting facts. And you stole my book. So it's, yeah. it's you. This is my job this time. I'm just going to give you, this, first of all, food, because you know how much I love food. So potatoes and tomatoes are both part of the nightshade family. You, that's not surprising. What is surprising is that a British company created a hybrid tomato plant that grows tomatoes on the top and potatoes on the bottom. <laughs> really? Yeah. Isn't that genius? So like the roots have potatoes in them. And then it has tomatoes on the top. So oh, who knew? A teacher. Yeah. And this is talking about how potatoes are the most consumed vegetable in America, yeah. which I don't love because we have an argument in my family about whether or not a potato counts as a vegetable. I don't really think that it does, but my husband would differ. So there's okay. your curious fact for the day. Yeah. I never would have said a potato is a vegetable. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't it's seem starch. like, yeah, it's starch. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's great. Hey, so um, I'm curious what your Google searches were this week. Okay. I have four good ones for you. The first one is just, I don't know why I agreed to do this. It's embarrassing. Like, I don't know. I don't need everyone to know all the crazy things that I want to know. About. <laughs> I know. It's... <laughs> but Mal walked in the other day and I was like, I have fallen down a rabbit hole of canned fish like sardines, mackerels, herrings. I don't know why. I don't know. It's, I don't know how I got there. But anyway, I Googled, there's a brand, Nuri Sardines from Spain. They're supposed to be delicious. Oh. I also have been feeding a family of four kids for the last two weeks. So I Googled 16 bean soup because that's what we're having for dinner tomorrow. Okay. Also, I Googled Viking World Cruise because did you know that a world cruise is a thing you can go on? So it's I, 180 days 
It is 37 countries. I was with them. I was like, this, I want to do this. Yeah. It starts at $80,000. And I was like, okay, close that tab. I guess I'm not doing that. <laughs> and then my last one was March Madness Bracket because my bracket is doing awesome. All right. There you go. It's good. Yeah. Well, I think mine kind of tells you a little bit about my week. Um, but I'll start with the fun one, which was Brahms Abilene. Oh, yeah. Wanted, wanted to know what was going on there. Okay. Supposedly, Brahms is coming to Abilene. Um, New York Times three-body problem review. I was told I should read it. Okay. You know, I read the book. I read the first and the second book. And This is a new thing out on Netflix. Netflix show, <laughs> yeah. Uh, related to that was how many stars are in the universe? And the answer to that is just mind blowing mm. just in the milky way which is just a little just a little part of the universe just in the milky way they estimate 100 billion stars wow that's amazing that's quite a few yeah i, I never would have guessed that um and then number four <laughs> why is my windows 11 not finding my printer which oh, you know that was a whole big thing i'm glad that, we got that settled <laughs> That was, yeah. it was rough around the office for a couple of days. Well, none of the answers online helped, but I figured it out. Good job. So those are go. my searches. Yeah. Quick okay, picture well, of our brains. There is a picture into our brains. All right. Well, now it's time for State of the Union. All right, Rachel, I, before I get into State of the Union, let me just say, I like I like you running the show. <laughs> this is hard, and you're so I much like better. You too. <laughs> yeah, this, this is tough, and everyone's like, yeah, can you go back to doing that? <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> the first article, it's just a little FAFSA update. Of course. So, uh, as you know, yeah, Rachel, you, you've given us the all of the drama with FAFSA, well, lo and behold, remember last week we talked about how they were pushing out. Hey, we're getting the FAFSAs out. But instead of like 30,000, it was six, right? right? Yeah. Well, a, a new wrinkle to this was they, the Department of Education acknowledged that a calculation error by the Office of Federal Student Aid led to inaccurate aid estimates on hundreds of of thousands of institutional student information records, which now means that any student who had assets, it was not calculated in, therefore they should receive lower aid. So there's that. So also Matt though, they said they're not correcting them yeah. until the end of April. So right. if there was a miscalculation, they're like, we're just gonna hold on to this. And then at the end of April, then we'll fix it, right? So that's one huge problem. Also in this article, they, they said, so universities, why don't you estimate after right. all this? Which remember, there were some schools early in January who were like, we do not believe this is going to come out anytime soon. We are going to come up with a surrogate way to, to estimate. And uh, they did yeah. the right thing in that case. So For sure. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's another article that says that students will not be able to so students will not be able to go back and make adjustments right. uh, to the FAFSA until the first half of April. Um, and so, the, it, yeah, I think it's consistent. Also remember, not five, million, 5 million students have filled out FAFSAs now compared to 17 million last year at this time. So yeah. that just gives you an idea yeah. of the magnitude of the problem. I think it's like 35% of high school seniors um, have filled it out. So it's, yeah. it's a wreck. Sorry, guys. Yep. Okay. Another article. This is this is uh, called. This is from New York Magazine. It's called the craziest college admission season ever. This is a this is a fascinating article, and it's about. Um, so, this is really tracking Duke and admissions. So, for highly selective universities, I don't want to get really deep into this article. I just want to say. If you're curious about, I mean, most of the schools we serve are not in the position of Duke. They're they're um, not turning away 95% of applicants. And so this goes through the process of um, 
all the filters that they put on so that they can get to a reasonable number of applications to actually uh, evaluate. Yeah. So, um, anyway. I think I that's know. worth the whole read, right? So it's hard to summarize it's, it, but it is for sure worth a read, I think. Yeah, it's fa it's fascinating just to get in, inside the, you know, hardship of being a highly selective institution. Yeah. Um, so this is interesting, kind of related from an admission standpoint. This next article is about transfer students. And um, so it, there's an interesting trend with transfer students where they're receiving lower acceptance rates across top colleges. In this article, it, it breaks down that, that um, acceptance rates for public institutions are higher than at private institutions. But really, it's an interesting trend um, where in the past, uh, transfer students would be accepted at, at a, let's see, um, well, I don't, I, I missed it. <laughs> this happens sometimes, right? Where you're like, what's the this? No, what, what was it? This is what you don't, yeah. No, so, so at Harvard, it's 0.9% of transfer students now. Um, the median transfer admission rate was 6.5 percent and that was john hopkins university so if you think about students who th think well i'm going to go to this institution kind of get some foundational and then transfer into mit or an ivy league school it's really hard it's really hard so so i think if you take those two articles like what's going on in selective institutions and then you compound that as a transfer student it's um it is very hard yeah, it's super interesting. You know, the um, interview we did with, with Dr. Schenkel, the more I think about the work she's doing for transfer students, I just, it, ju it just is such smart work, right? It's just lovely. So. Yeah. And, and so I think there's definitely a future where really having those bridges uh, laid out is, is going to be very helpful. Okay, I want to change gears a little bit. This next article is about uh, career development, and this is colleges getting involved in career development. Um, it's interesting because I've been reading about, you know, our background came out of career development, and, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because um, there's there's a workplace gap right now, a hiring gap between what employers are looking for and what they're saying millennials uh, or Gen Z candidates are delivering, and so. Um, so this article is about do, even providing etiquette dinners, which we, we've talked about. And, I and think we did those. Um, yeah, we did. Yeah. We, yeah. Years ago. But it's still very um, uh, necessary. So in this article, employers are saying that many young people lack key workplace skills and professionalism. A January survey found over half of hiring managers who interviewed Gen Z candidates say that the candidate was not dressed appropriately, 58%, struggled with eye contact, 57%, and even after being hired, one third of hiring managers say that their Gen Z staff don't dress professionally or use appropriate language at work. Okay, so one of the solutions is, I, I think this, this approach is, is pretty um, interesting. It's so with an etiquette dinner, there's a whole lot of things that they're introducing to students. So at the etiquette dinner, how to introduce yourself to a stranger with confidence, how to use a napkin, silverware, and glassware, engaging with the wait staff, which is, I mean, really. People like, watch you. you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, are you grateful for the people who are serving you, right? Deciding what to order and what not to order, which we that's know. A whole thing. That's, yeah. that's a whole thing. Um, appropriate conversation topics. Determining who will pay for the tip or cool. pay any tip. Um, Listen, Matt, you know what the thing, what I like about etiquette, the reason we have etiquette is so that everybody feels safe. That's why we learn it because yeah, there's right. all of these different like, well, but what do we do and what's and what do you think I should do this? And, do? and so the whole goal of etiquette is that everybody comes into it under the same rules and it's not to make people feel bad or stupid. It's actually to do the reverse of that, that you can come in with confidence yeah. and just know this is how we 
talk about the weather and this is how we introduce ourselves and those sorts of things. So I, I, it is a great, you know, where I was talk, talking about modeling and practicing. I think it's a great way to do that. One of the things that they um, suggest is having a cocktail hour so that you can help your students navigate alcohol and the more fluid social scene. Which I, I feel like probably there's two sides to that, right? There's like, if you drink and if you don't drink and you still have to show up sometimes for business in a cocktail hour where other people are drinking. And so how do you stand and have conversation and not feel like you stick out either way, right? There's a lot to navigate about that. So I just like for us to practice things. I think it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And that this cocktail hour is not like a college party hour. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> right yeah. <laughs> There's no keg stands. There's no solo cups. This is a different. Right, right, right. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no drinking games. Okay. Another article. This is from the University of South Florida. They're launching a college for AI. So, you know, I mean, artificial intelligence is super hot in the news. Wait, what um, does that mean? They're launching a college for students to learn how to do AI or what? So, so in the in the fall of 2025, they are opening the College of Artificial Intelligence, Cybersecurity, and Computing. So so right now, this is embedded with the computer science, but cool. uh, they're saying this is the right time. Either we do it now or 10 years from now, we'll chase after other entities who have done it. So they're looking Listen ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking about our school, Montreat, and cybersecurity. Yeah. They started that. I mean, I think they're one of the first in the, the first, nation to start yeah. it ten, probably 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. And yeah. they have just been it's been exponential growth for them. They were ahead of the curve. They've done a really great job. So I think that's right. We're, we're, we're past the point of like, what is it now? Um, and we're into the like how, but really how are we going to use it? And interestingly uh, that you mentioned Montreat because the president, Paul Maurer is in DC right now being recognized for oh. their cybersecurity partnerships awesome. with other. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Okay. That's very cool. Okay, my last, and I, I really love this article. Last one, solving higher ed's DFW problems. So students who um, uh, get a, did not, the D is a, did not finish, right? F is an F and a W is a withdrawal. I think it's a D, an F, and a withdrawal. Okay, so, so the issue is you have students who were not completing, uh, so they got a D, an F or a W, they didn't earn credits for the class, and um, then they weren't completing, they weren't retaking that class, and they were actually dropping out, weren't able to move forward in their degree. And so uh, Georgia State University started to see a huge jump in the number of students who were receiving DFWs. And so they, they and, and so Georgia State is the home of the National Institute of Student Success. So they launched a program that would allow students to get back on track. They called it the Accelerator Academy. It was piloted in summer of 2021. It allowed students to take a course at no extra cost on an accelerated timeline with supplemental instruction, near peer mentoring and proactive advising. So they started this program and then they, they said, not only is it gonna be no cost to you, but we're going to give you a $500 educational grant. Uh, and they use that from pandemic funds. Well. They had over 400 students in the pilot accelerator program earn grades of C or better um, with 98 or 25% of those students earning A's. So they went from a D or an F or a W to an A. That success rate um, is continuing. It's now 80% uh, of their students having success. And um, as a result, there's this organization that uh, UIA, which stands for University Innovation Alliance. And so Georgia State is a part of this. 10 other universities said, we love your model. We want to implement this. So now it's taking off. Not only have they seen improvements of students who complete and replace that, that grade, but um, huge retention, 85% retention rates of students who go through this accelerator program, huge. Well, as I was doing my reading on University Innovation Alliance, look it up. Uh, if you're um, someday looking at Google, and you want to look it up. Because when, when I look 
when I looked this group up, University Innovation Alliance, a group of universities across the US who are participating in this, right at the top, they have a link to request to join our spring process mapping cohort. And you so they're all about process mapping. Well, yeah. process mapping, they're all about really figure, let's figure out, let's look upstream, let's figure out what's happening. And Bridget Burns, the CI, uh, CEO of UIA said, one of the many things that she's learned leading the Alliance thus far is that one of the most significant barriers to innovation is the story that campuses tell themselves about what's possible and what's not. So if you're interested in process mapping to figure out really what's possible, how to make things easier, remove barriers, I, I love what's that's happening. Whole, I, I think you were saying that's like a whole apprenticeship, right? Like, hey, we're going to practice and we're going to look at processes and we're going to teach you how to do it and yeah. teach you how to talk to other people. So it for sure, you know, that's one of those things that we talk about all the time. We talk about it like process mapping, but it is a specific skill. And so yeah. if you don't feel like you don't have that skill, that would be a great way to, to learn it. So, yes. All right. Well, University Innovation Alliance, look it up, join it's six weeks of process map mapping, uh, learning how to create and um, process maps and overcome roadblocks. So, awesome. all right, well, that is the State of the Union. Don't you feel so powerful when you say that? Man, I, you know, that is, you're very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I make it look easy. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rachel, so, um, Thanks for joining me today yeah, and letting me, me interview you today. Um, so Can this I is- just, Listen, I got to put a disclaimer. Okay. Because I was just talking to you and Z and I was saying like, nobody knows how actually tender hearted I am. So we're just going to play a little like, uh, what's that called? Like r rally game where you keep track of like how many times I actually cry during this. Everybody keep, get there at me. My, I, I really don't want big tears. I'll try and help manage that. But look, Rachel, this is the first time that I have interviewed you in 18 years. So the first time I interviewed you was 18 years ago. I haven't had an occasion to interview you since. True. Um, now, 18 years ago is when you told me you didn't want you didn't even want the job. That's right. <laughs> so, I think people have heard this story before, but let me just say in summary. There was a job opening at ACU. Matt was hiring for it. I had a bunch of people who were like, hey, you should apply for this job. And I was like, I don't want that stupid job. I don't, it, I mean, it turned out to be a great job, but I was like, I don't want that job. I was feeling a little snotty. <laughs> um, I am a person of faith. So I believe that one night I got woken up and God was like, hey, go fill out this application that my husband Clint had brought home. And I was like, okay, I don't tend to be disobedient. So I'm going to do it but just leave me alone about this stupid job. So I filled it out in pencil because although I am obedient, I am very stubborn <laughs> and it's for the career center. So no one in their right mind would ever hire me for that job, right? Three days so later, you called me, you're like, come in for an interview. I came in, you were like, why do you want this job? I was like, just to be clear, I do not want this job. <laughs> Which little did I know was the wrong thing to say at the time because you're like, why would you not want this job? What's wrong with you? So yeah. here well, we go years later. It was a perfect fit. What I what I love about that is it's a remarkable example of how one event can really shape the whole future. Yeah, Matt, because the footnote on that is that years later when I said to you, I cannot believe you called me in for an interview when I did it i did my application in pencil you said what <laughs> and i was like you didn't notice it was in pencil and you're like hr handed me a photocopy i had no idea it was in pencil had i known i never would have called you right yeah. so like yeah. just these like little things that happen and here we are 18 years later so yep well one of the things that that stood out to me in that interview and it still does today i think one of the the gifts that you bring uh is is your just a lifelong learner. And and really when I was asking you about your, uh, I, I think the question was, tell me about a time where you had to learn a complicated process. What, were, what was the situation? What were the results? And yeah. you told me about McKay's Bakery. Yeah, so I worked 
for McKay's Bakery for about a year and a half between when I got married and when I graduated with my master's degree. And I just, I worked there because it was like a little kind of boutique shop and I, I thought it was fun. But um, I, I love to learn. I can't help myself. I want to learn everything. And so in the time I worked at the bakery, I just told our manager like, hey, will you, can I learn all of it? I want, and anything that we do in this bakery, I want to learn. So I learned how to bake the cakes. I learned how to do the breakfast things. The hardest was the muffins because our manager, Rob, would do it with his hands. So he'd like have the cup tins, like the, the cupcake tins, and he would scoop into this big bucket of batter with his hands, like super fast. I was like, okay, I have pretty big hands. I think I can do that. So I did. <laughs> I how to do that. But it was like the way that I made sense of that job was just what else? What else is there? Like what else could I figure out how to do? And it's really nice because years later, I have a lot of bakery skills that I wouldn't have had otherwise. <laughs> and you don't even like to bake. So I hate, to bake. I hate yeah. it, but, but I'm, I can do it. So, well, okay. So you accepted, you accepted that position four months later, we needed a career counselor. We needed to move you from academic and at-risk student support into a career counselor mode. And you reluctantly took that on, but then this is a great example of, of Rachel Phillips' book. So you took that on. Next thing you know, you've built the discovery program, which uh, affected hundreds of students every year. Will you describe a little bit about that experience? Yeah. So I really didn't want to do career counseling. It felt like a very sort of technical, non, um, this seems really terrible to say, but like non-meaningful counseling. Like, right, like I'm like family and marriages and like all of that kind of stuff. And then someone's like, can you do career counseling? And I was like, that sounds horrible. Um, but we really needed someone. So you're like, hey, can you just do it for a couple of months? And then as I started meeting with students, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is the most meaningful counseling there can be. This yeah, is yeah. about making sense of your life and who are you and how you're going to impact the world for good. And so then I started looking around at the way we were doing it in a really sort of haphazard way and really understanding like the, the pain of these students and the hunger to know who they were. And I was like, we just have to come up with a um, informed and professional way to lead these students through things because I know what their questions are. They either right. don't work themselves well enough, they are not good at making decisions, they don't know about the jobs there are, or they have anxiety about landing the plane, right? And so over the next couple of years, just built a program that's lockstep for students to be able to, to choose their major. And then I started ha having people who had chosen their major be like, hey, can I join? And I was like, right, because you didn't really choose your major. You just wrote down something on a piece of paper right. <laughs> with your admissions counselors. So then we changed it to, to, to choose and confirm your major which was really lovely because at the end of that, then you had students who were sure about how they made the decision and then they went on to be super successful. So it was a really, really fun process and very meaningful for me. What I love about that is just thinking about how all of these things became really key foundational pieces to your understanding of an at-risk student, all the different facets, the things that could influence that. Um, so from you know, students who were on probation students who haven't picked a major yet, um, stu students who um, just needed to talk because they didn't, they really didn't feel like even their advisor would listen to them, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, but before, I, I wanna go back because part of your story is uh, you're from Manhattan, you're this New Yorker and, and so just going back and, and thinking about growing up in Manhattan, uh, we'll fast forward in, in a little bit and talk more about you coming to Texas, but going back to growing up in, in Manhattan, what what would you say shaped you in that? Yeah, it's a really strange experience, right? Because you're surrounded by people constantly who are not paying any attention to you. So I actually felt really, really free. I still feel really free in cities because there's too many people for you to acknowledge all of them. 
and no one is looking at you. Like no one is paying any attention because there's lots of very strange people all around and you don't want to get involved because you would never get anything done. Right. So for me, it just really was freeing, especially as a little kid. I lived there from the time I was six months old until I was 13. So like all of my formative years were about walk fast, get where you're going and you're safe because no one is paying attention to you. Um, Contrast that with some of my experience in Texas, which my brother one time came to visit and we walked into a restaurant and he's like, why is everybody staring at us so aggressively? And I was like, look, they think they might know us. Like they probably do know us. There's probably people in here. So when someone walks in, right, everyone looks to see who it is. So um, when I took my daughter to New York to visit Z a couple of years ago, it was like I all of a sudden made sense as her mom. She was like, I understand now why you don't, you're not paying attention to people around you. You are walking fast. You're in a hurry to get plate. Like, I'm just very efficient. I like to get things done, you know? And so when we got back to Texas, she was like, I was leaving the grocery store and the guy was pushing the cart behind me. And she's like, mom, you're New York, New York walking. He can't keep up. Go slower. And I was like, oh, okay. Thanks. So it for sure shapes the way my brain works. Yeah. And and so also you're the daughter of a minister and an actor. Your mom was an actor. Yeah. And so how describe how that shaped you. I mean, I would say the two things about that are first of all, I'm very familiar with making your living with words. Both of my parents do that. So I come by that honestly. But also I had a really delightful experience of getting to watch my dad work all the time. Every Sunday and every Wednesday he would preach. And so we would listen to a sermon and come home and have dinner and talk about it or, you know, Sunday lunch. Um, It was not uncommon when my mom was in a play for us to go to every single one that she would do. And so that's that was a really fun experience. And it's really nice that my daughter has the same thing. Like she knows what I do. She's seen me in meetings before. She's seen me do demos. And so she has a really intimate knowledge of how I make a living. Right. And that's fun. Yeah. Okay. So one more thing that I know about you that I think helps shape who you are today. And that is uh, growing up, going to Camp Hunt. So Camp Hunt is in upstate New York. You were a camper. You were a counselor. Then you became kind of the head honcho of this camp. I'm just curious. I mean, I, I see it, but can you describe, so just your working with, with the campers there? Yeah, for sure. So it came out of this. Yeah. So I went to this camp from the time I was nine until I was like 23, just like moving up the ranks. Um, the two things about it for me were, first of all, I had this very stable group of friends that I didn't get to see all the time, but I would spend all summer with them. I was there usually for eight weeks. And so that level of friendship and intimacy changes the way you think about friendships, right? Because it's like, I, it just takes me a very long time. Like Matt, we were, we knew each other for probably six years before one day I said, I think we're friends because when you call me, I answer the phone. And you're like, we've known each other for six years. <laughs> Do you think yeah. now? Like you've just decided that, right? So that was one thing is that I had a really, really close knit group of friends that, that really knew me because we had spent so much time together. Um, But also I just always got along with the kids who were outsiders, like the kids who got in trouble when I was the director, they just wanted to be close to me. I understood their perspective and even then wanted to make a safe place where they felt unconditional positive regard and weren't in trouble all the time. Right. And, and I could say to them like, Hey, you're being ridiculous. Please stop what you're doing so you can stop getting in trouble with everybody. But I really love to be close to those kids. And we had a lot of fun together. They they could stand up under my real rebuke of them because they knew that I was I loved them. Right. Like you're good in my book. Just stop being dumb. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I know that kind of gave you this understanding of your gift set and connecting with people and helping guide people. Um, But from your experiences, um, when you decide to go to a college a thousand miles away in West Texas, 
I just want to talk a little bit about your ACU experience because I, yeah. I know that this also shapes who you are and, and influences all the things that you do today. Um, so you, you've said in the past that you describe yourself as, as a terrible student, which isn't really true. Um, you, you actually earned a 4.0 your first semester, and I, I think you did pretty well in your second semester, not a 4.0. But then it got, I think you would say it got hard. Things just started piling up, yeah. and and today we call that success debt. But as as you've talked about this, I think it would be helpful for you to to talk about that experience of like what what was happening to you. What were the things that started to pile on that you can now describe as success debt? Yeah, I mean. To be really clear, success debt, 100 percent, the name of that came out of my experience at ACU. Right. I understand that concept because of what I experienced there. So I would say I showed up at, at my college bright eyed and bushy tailed, <laughs> actually with some expectation that it was going to be difficult because I, I did understand like I've been going to school with the same people since I was in sixth grade. Now I've got to meet new people like I had an expectation of that. So I think for the first semester, I I actually wasn't so distressed to not be making friends and like understanding the language and the culture and all of that. I, I really wasn't unhappy with that. But I think what started to happen was I did start to accumulate success debt. So it's like the first six weeks when you don't have good friends, when you expect that to be true, you're like, OK, I mean, this is fine. I'm just going to focus on my academics and the result of that was that at the end of the semester, I'd done really, really well. But at the end of a semester, when you're like, I still kind of don't have any friends. And then you do another semester and you're still you're still acquiring that success debt. At some point, you're just like, this is too much for me. And it so, was kind of horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so especially for you and knowing you, and, and I think one of the things that that's remarkable to me is is um, for all of our schools, they have students like that on campus who who are kind of surprised at, at, at a certain point, surprised that they're an at-risk student, right? right? So when you look back, you're like, right. how was I, how wasn't I an at-risk student? Was it surprising to you? I well, what I would say is I didn't make a great choice of college. So so let me let me say it like this. I didn't have a good way of choosing a college. So whether or not the college I picked would have been a great choice for me or not, the disadvantage it had is that when I was in the middle of it and it was hard, I was like, I don't even know why I picked this place, yeah. right? That's super hard to overcome because it could be the right place for you, but you didn't go through a, a really clear external process to choose it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's really hard. Obviously there's culture shock, that was hard um, to overcome. I, I probably should have sure. understood better a little bit, like how crazy town that was going to be. Um, walking in the grocery store would have told you there's a little culture shock there. Yeah, my story about walking in the grocery store when I was a freshman was I walked in with some people from ACU and the woman was checking me out. She's like, how are you, honey? And I was like, how's that your business? I don't understand why you're talking to me. I don't know what. And they were like, hey, hey, hey <laughs> we're friendly here. <laughs> So um, I think there were things that I probably should have seen coming or that somebody could have named for me yeah. that would have cued me off that maybe I would have some rocky times. So in in that, what, what was your early indicator that you really were struggling? What would have been or what would have been an early indicator if for someone at the university kind of looking at Rachel, what would have in the early sign that, hey, this isn't going great? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think you would just start with orientation. <laughs> Which if you had just said to me after the first thing I did in orientation, which you have to understand, I'm as an extreme introvert as I can get. Like on the scale, I cannot score higher on introversion, right? So I'm I'm mustering myself up to go to orientation. I know I have to meet new people. I'm just like willing myself to go do it. And we've talked about before, like in our orientation, the first thing you do is walk into this coliseum and there's all of these screaming upperclassmen with signs that you have to find your right place. 
And I just have like imprinted on my brain, like the horror. <laughs> it was just a very extroverted feeler experience, right? Yeah. And then, so if you had said to me after that, how did that go? Assuming I would tell you the truth, right? I would have been like, that was my worst. Like, I never, I don't want to do anything else in orientation. So I think there were a lot of places where if had if someone had been paying attention, they would have been like, hey, here's a person who didn't go to church with all these people, didn't go to camp with all these people, right? Isn't from around here. She probably needs a little bit more attention in terms of um, like community adjustment, I guess is what I'd say. So I know this is like the, the deepest dive we've ever taken on, you know, video for <laughs> you talking about this, but I, I'm just curious when, because there's so many students who are like you, smart, eager, learners, but just struggling, not connecting, right? How, how did you recover? Because you did recover. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the impetus for me to recover was, first of all, I was going to have an undergraduate degree in psychology with a GPA too low to get into graduate work. So that was pretty scary. Um, but eventually, you know, I did have camp friends who came. So these people that I really did trust, they came. And so I had a smaller circle of students there who I trusted. I had some really great professors who I told you about, Dr. Beck, a couple of weeks ago, who was like, I'm going to teach you this statistic stuff until you get it, because I can tell you don't. Um, I had a professor, Dr. Trevathan, who just was like, very kind to me. I don't, I can't talk no, about it's, it. It's no, it's, super yeah. meaningful to have somebody who was like, hey, I see you and you're doing a great job and you belong here. So my tears are honoring of him and how kind he was to me. Sorry, Rachel. Sorry. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> influential. Um, I'll say this, we once went to a campus and did an exercise for the board. And so we passed out puzzle pieces and it was all these different pieces to a, a student's story. And in that, on the on the back of it, a board member would read out loud, this is this is a fact that I know about this student. And they went around the room and they read all these facts about a student. They had this SAT, they had this first uh, term GPA, they all of these things, they came from New York, they right. Well, every one of those facts was about you. And, right. and then the board started talking about whether or not they thought the student was going to be successful. And I'll never forget one of the board members who was very successful himself. He said, I think she was successful. I, I, when I read that she walked to get medicine, even though she was sick for days, she got, she got up and she took care of herself. I think she's got grit. I think she's resilient. I think she's going to be successful. And that was pretty neat to hear because you're like, Hey, yeah, it was super helpful to me. So in that exercise, everyone's discussing what's going to happen to the student, me, while I'm listening to them, right? Yeah. And, and when that guy was like, I think she, I think she did great. And I was like, hold on, why are you saying that? And so his reflection to me, you know, this, this is true of a lot of my story, which is when I put my mind to a thing, usually I'm successful. Like I just do have a lot of, I don't know if it's determination or stubbornness, um, but it was really nice to have his reflection of, look at all of these things that you've overcome and you, you clearly just made up your mind. And to be fair, it had people who poured into me and, and appreciated, you know, what I was doing. So. Yeah. All right. Well, you did get it together. You were resilient. You earned your bachelor's, earned an MFT, uh, became an LPC, you're now in a doctoral program. I, I think that's a great success story on its own. Um, I, I wonder what you would say, looking back it, to that 18 year old Rachel, what would you say to her that at risk Rachel, knowing what you know now and all that you've accomplished and. Yeah, for sure. I actually think that, um, so I have a lot of compassion for that student, me because I feel like there was a lot of people kind of doing a terrible job of caring for me. So 
I would just want to say that student, what we say all the time, you are not alone. There are people who should be on your team. Matt, I think about the indicators of risk. So not just orientation. I had my U100 class, which, which ended up being terrible because I would show up and everyone would be friends and I would just be there like, why do I have to show up where all these people are like loving life? And I'm like, don't know anyone. Yeah. I wasn't going to classes. I was on chapel probation. I had an RA who wasn't paying attention to me. So there's a part there where for sure I was learning and growing as a person and I take responsibility for that. But also I would say to that 18 year old girl, I'm so sorry, no one saw you. I'm so sorry. And what we're trying to do is make sure that never happens again. Right. That's right. Well, I, I just think it's so helpful for, for our listeners to hear that piece of it because it is what really fuels all that you do, right? Uh, just thinking about, we have students who are on your campus and they feel very alone. And what can you do to just say, I see you, right? And and so I think um, in all of that, the the where was everyone in, in this, it's crazy because we do have a lot of partners. I, I think that's also what, uh, why why the relationship constellations really resonates with you, right? That, that hey, a, a student needs to be surrounded with people. And if you knew they didn't have a connection, we've got to work hard to make that connection. So, yeah, for sure. um, well, I love that. And, and so people need to know that out of all of that, Rachel really invested in not only the work of like the discovery program and building out SOS or or an early alert system in actually the software. I want to fast forward to 2008 because um, you would really help craft the software at our university to, to be able to identify, find the students and engage them quickly, right? And in 2008, um, I was able to take that technology out of the university and start Ferris Resources and you were the first person I called. Uh, hey, so I was able to make this happen but I need you, can you actually show people um, how to use this thing? And I asked you to do two things that I can't believe you said yes to do. Yeah, they were both kind of not what I would ever choose to do. The first one was, well, I didn't mind doing demos so much, but I was like, I'm not selling. But of course I was selling. I was, I was telling people about a tool that I knew was going to make their life better and easier and help them find students, but I was selling. And then also I had to write the first manual for how to use Ferris 360. Right. Which is very detailed work. I mean, we had not, we had nothing. Yeah. It was like, I think it's like 35 pages. And I remember when we hired Z and she took support over from me and I was like, I just gave her the hard copy. And I was like, I never want to have to do this again. (laughs) And she was like, took it and made it way better and like has done so much work on that. But I did have to do the very first uh, Ferris 360 manual. And so that's how Rachel came over uh, and and we co-founded Ferris and and, um, everyone likes to say, you know, what what a great overnight success, but it really wasn't, right? So fast forward 2012, um, your daughter Lillian is a baby and it was very, it was a very difficult season for Ferris. Actually didn't know whether or not Ferris would survive 2012, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm telling you the challenges and you said, oh, Matt, I'll, I'll work quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you're like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah, I mean, again, when I, when I believe in a thing, which I 100% did, I knew that we were built on the right philosophy. I knew that practitioners were going to love what we were doing. I knew that we had good work at the heart of our business. And I'm, I, people like to be around me because when I have conviction about something, I'm pretty unswaying. Yeah. And so, which sometimes is not great, but in this case, I just felt so strongly that we were doing the right thing and that if we just would keep doing it, we would in the end be rewarded for it. 
And I couldn't imagine having a tool that I knew was going to help practitioners and students and just being like, okay, well, I guess no one ever gets to use that again. Right. It just, I couldn't imagine it. Yeah. So I, I think um, that conviction is uh, obviously it's exactly what I needed. It was like, okay, let's go do this for our team. It rallied the team. Um, it helped us connect with the right schools. The other crazy thing is you're like, let's not, I mean, in the middle of all of that, we had schools where you're like, I don't want to work with them. That's not the right school for us, which is so you know, hard, Matt. When we're like, oh my gosh, but they want to give us how much money? No, right. we cannot work with them. They are not thinking about it in the right way. And yeah. the pieces of like alienating students by the way you talk to them and the messaging you send them and the things that you want us to build that I know are the wrong things to build. Um, it's just, there's something really nice about knowing you're doing the right thing in the right way. It gives you a lot of courage and confidence to say, we're just going to keep doing it because I know that it's, it's good. Right. Yeah. And, and it's so fun now with just looking at our, the clients we serve and for them to be able to hear that confidence for when they're in the middle of really hard work, yeah. but also to know that now they have the tools that'll help them in, in all over all of these years. So there is this, I know that you've mentioned Red Bud Day um, in the past several times, but there is this like optimistic side of you that uh, it's pretty contagious, right? So Bailey, I, I know you've got an image here and I'd love for you, Rachel, to, to describe Red Bud Day and, and what that meant. <clears throat> okay, well, Red Bud Day, so you have to know that I'm a seven on the Enneagram, which means I tend to be very optimistic. I tend to be able to understand things in terms of how I can um, not control them, but like shape them, right? So when I graduated with my psychology degree, I graduated in December and I went home to live with my parents in Indiana, December, January, February, March, April. And I got a job at a country and Western radio station because I had worked at NPR at ACU and you can't, that's the kind of job you can get with an undergraduate degree in psychology. Right. So I was going, I was, I had the morning shift. And so every morning I would wake up in the dark and I would drive, it was like 40 minutes away. I would drive 40 minutes to get to the basement that I worked in FM 102 WCBK. And I would play country music all morning, which I don't know if you know, but it's depressing. <laughs> yeah. And then I would leave and then I would go home. And it was Indiana in the winter, which is the season of the sticks. That's exactly what it was like every <laughs> morning. I would drive through <clears throat> woods that looked like this in the dark to my job. And one morning I was just like, I just cannot do this anymore. This is despair. Yeah. This picture is great. <laughs> this is exactly how I felt about it. And it was always foggy because it was cold. I mean, it just was, I was cold and dark and season of the sticks and awful. And I was like, I just can't keep doing this. It's just so awful. And I looked into the woods that looked like this and I saw these tiny little purple buds hidden back in the woods. And I was like, oh my gosh, okay, okay, it's gonna be okay. Like spring is coming, it's gonna get warm, the leaves are gonna come, the job is gonna get better, I'm gonna go back to school. And it was such a great experience of redemption of like, you think everything's dead, but don't worry because here's these little signs that it's gonna be okay and you're gonna come back to life and everything's gonna be really great. So it is a pretty sacred <laughs> experience for me. My daughter and I celebrate Red, Red Bud Day every year when we see the Red Buds first appear, we go and get ice cream and we talk about how we're coming out of one season into the next. Um, but I do think I love it so much because it is about this glimmer is all I need. Just give me a little glimmer. And then I'm like, okay, all right, I'm good. We can keep going. Right. I love that. So the thing that I love about that, that optimism is you, you're contagious with that, not only at Ferris, but also with our schools. And a lot of, a lot of people need that right now. Like give them, give me that glimmer. So right. um, yeah. <clears throat> also just thinking about there's, there's a lot of things that I want to go through. Um, 
that you've taught me. And, and then I want to end on uh, some, some specific things with Ferris 360. Love for our listeners to hear. Um, but, but a couple of things. So going to a campus, my background in services, excellence in designing great systems. And, and then your background is systems theory, which I never really thought about the complexity of a university. It was always like solve this problem and and I, you know, so let's figure out this problem and this process. But you're like, hey, no, everything's a system. So will you describe systems theory and how that relates to higher ed? I mean, the easiest way to explain it is just that everything is connected and a small change in any part of the system changes everything, right? So it can be as small as language. It's why language is so important, because if we go from academic probation to academic recovery, we've changed a hundred things in the system. We've changed the way faculty think about it, the way students experience, the way that we put the students through the process, the things that are important in that process. Like that one change changes so many things about the system. And so if you think about a university, we don't have to be at the top changing big things. We can find little signals, um, habits, processes. Think about the school we went to where the students who were conditionally admitted, everybody got a folder, except those students had a gigantic red sticky note on the front of it that said conditionally admitted. And they're in a room with other students. And we were like, hey, change that one little thing and you're going to change everything about this process right yeah. so i like the power of being able to change little things like language or or signals and have a huge impact on the system yeah so another another thing that you've uh introduced me to is this idea of expert expert and how you can show up but also uh invite someone else to show up in that can you unpack that a little bit more yeah, I mean, it's one of my favorites. So expert, expert just means I'm an expert in a thing and you're an expert in a thing and we're going to come together and have a conversation about it. Honestly, Matt, I think the reason I like it is because I have expertise and I like being able to show up as an expert instead of diminishing what I know. But I also have humility so that I know I'm an expert in some things, but I don't know the school and I don't know the context and I don't know how they got where they're going. And so... I just like both of us showing up in our full power and being able to do really good work. You know, sometimes we have um, people where they can't show up in their full power or they don't want us to show up in our full power. And so then you can do like a one down where you're like, oh, yeah, you know, so much, you know, that kind of thing. You can do that. It's just it's it's so inefficient. It just is so much better if you can say to whoever you're talking to. Show up with everything you have because you have a lot of stuff I don't have and I'm going to do the same and we're going to do really good work. Well, you just said another word that that is a part of you and I love about you. I think it go, goes back to when we first uh, interviewed is that you love efficiency. You want to get it done and let's, let's not uh, drag this out, right? If my daughter had to give you all of the words I have for dilly-dallying, there's a lot of them, right? So I just like us first to accomplish the things so we can get on to the next thing, right? And so I am always upstream thinking and thinking about how do we make sure that our practitioners who have so much work are not wasting their time doing things that don't make sense or duplicating effort or trying to figure out a process that's not sensical. All right, so that leads right into Ferris 360 and why it was created the tools in 360, the, I, I guess this, this, this um, hatred of inefficiency, right? Um, but that's where Ferris 360 came about. So can you talk about that vision? And so what kind of fueled that, how 360 has been shaped? Because, so if, I think people know you're the visionary of Ferris 360. From the very beginning, what does it need? You've, you've kind of set the roadmap you've looked ahead, you've been very successful in predicting what our uh, schools need and what students need so that they can be seen and, and successful, right? So can you unpack that a little bit more? Just just the, the things that go into when you're thinking about 360, what, what um, kind of, how do you prioritize 
Yeah, I mean, I think the two things are, I'm, I'm first of all, always thinking about our students and always thinking about how do I get a student connected to a person, not, not technology, but to a person. And so, you know, we got to find them first. So we need technology to do that. But I want for our technology to facilitate real life experiences for our students with practitioners. So that's always at the heart of what I'm thinking of. Um, and we can't be lazy about that. We were just on a campus where someone was like, hey, can you send automatic when we get this? Can it tell the student that they're doing a bad job and then send them blah? And I really respected their VP for student success because he was like, that's not what we do here. That's lazy. Yeah. That is not what we do. We go and find our students and we see them. So although you might want that to be true, that's not what we do. So I really love that perspective. But also, Matt, I'm like, I have this picture in my head of practitioners who are doing such good, important work in finding students and seeing them and making sure they're safe. And I want for Ferris to be like running alongside of them, like the nurse for the surgeon. You know what I mean? Where they're like, I need to text the student. We're like, here, I need to find their schedule here. I got to figure out how what they said on their non-cognitive behavior, right? Like, I just want for them to have all of those tools so that it's this seamless experience for them of figuring out what's happening with students instead of a disjointed, like, hold on, I can't pay attention to you because I have to call this person to figure this thing out. So my perspective for our practitioners is just how do I give you all the things exactly when you need them so that you can spend more time with the student who really needs your focus and relationship and energy with them. And to find that 18-year-old Rachel. I mean, it just makes perfect sense. Yeah, for sure. It's it's actually really fulfilling to me to have all of that terrible experience redeemed by saying that experience made me a wounded healer where now I can come in and I can say, I understand what it's like to be that student alone. And I also understand what it's like to be a practitioner and show up for them. And so how can we use those two pieces to just continually be pressing practitioners forward to, to be in connection with that poor 18 year old kid who somebody should have said, I don't feel like it's going great for you. <laughs> right. Somebody should have said that to me. That's awesome. I mean, well, I'm grateful you're resilient. I know that there are a hundred, hundreds of thousands of students who have been supported because you went through that and you are a healer. Um, anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. I feel super privileged to be in the position I am and to do the work I am. And I hope that everyone can hear that we believe in this work. This is yep. not just a, yeah, and then we go to work and then we come home, but it is really heartfelt um, life journey work that we get to do. So thank you guys for letting us do it. It's really a privilege. For sure. Rachel, thanks for letting me try and interview you today. No, it was great. I appreciate it. And next week, we are going to have Allison Ash from Credo on the show. You guys will love her. She um, just is another person who I really respect and does great work in the space of higher education. So thanks for joining us. Good job, Matt. Thanks. Bye.